officially start our meeting with the ringing of the Melly Bell. So uh, thank you so much. A couple of welcoming comments. I want to share with you uh, one thing that one of our very own Rotarians, Ebony Lachey Moore, has been recognized as a community impact leader for Denver Kids. So uh, the write-up about Ebony is that she is a Denver Kids graduate. She has been giving back to the Denver Kids program with her time and resources. Ebony was the keynote speaker at the 2019 annual breakfast gala for Denver Kids, and she celebrated with senior gift bags. She is all about accelerating the journey towards improved lives and healthier communities. She has been recognized as a transformational leader, leveraging her own story in public speaking, empowering others facing similar challenges to adopt the same growth mindset, which is grow, grow through what you go through. So Ebony's, I would consider a personal friend of mine. It's been great to meet her through Rotary. Um, you'll see about a, a loving local gala that Denver Kids is hosting on November 14th. Would encourage you to attend. And if you want, uh, you'll also see information about that in the meeting recap. So I want to congratulate Ebony on that recognition. Very well deserved and excited to celebrate that with her. Um, I would also encourage people at the meetings, if you haven't done so at 1145, join us at that 1145 mark. We are doing breakout rooms. And so it's a fun way to get with a smaller group of people and connect. Also uh, wanted to remind you that the membership team is meeting at 115 immediately following this meeting. If you want the link to that, you can reach out via chat to Chad Tyler or to me. And also the Rotary Foundation is meeting this afternoon at 3.30. So again, you could reach out to me or to Peg Johnston. And finally, I would encourage you all to vote. I voted today. And I also wanted to share my latest creation, which is my Rotary mask. What do you think? So working on that to see if we can get it more centered and more colorful, but it might be like a fundraising opportunity. So with that, I'd like you to join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. You are all muted, but please follow along. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Our inspirational moment today is a little bit different. We are doing a video provided by Rotarian Kate Richards. So I'm gonna invite you to listen along. I stood in silence, but I stood tall. I stood with my eyes closed. My heartbeat slowed to an unfamiliar pace. My doors were locked. My streets were swept in solitude. I still stood tall. I stood tall because of you. Your spirit lifted me up. You gave me my roots. You're the reason I held strong. We've sacrificed a lot to get this far, but our job's not done. It's the seventh inning stretch, a set break before the encore. Our band is warming up, and when the curtain opens, we'll be ready, ready to dance again.
Thank you for that very unique and inspiring inspirational moment. Next is our club secretary's report. Troy Szymanski is our club secretary and is partner and fund manager of Outpost Fund. All right, thank you very much, Debbie. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so we wanna start off by welcoming all of our guests. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, Zoom Rotary meeting. Uh, next up, I wanna say happy birthday to a few of our members for this week. Uh, this week's birthdays are uh, Matt Walsh and Lee Everding. So happy birthday to the two of you. Send them a card, send them a note, send them a hey. Uh, happy birthday. Finally, you've got some announcements. So uh, join us as always this evening for the virtual Rotary Happy Hour uh, at 5.30. There will be a link provided in the uh, meeting recap email to follow at about one o'clock mountain time. Don't forget to register for the Rotary International President's Virtual Luncheon on Sunday, November 1st from noon to 1 p.m. This meeting is in lieu of our regular club meeting on October 29th, and the club is covering the cost for all membership types, and $25 of that cost will be donated to Polio Plus, which each member will receive Paul Harris Fellow credits for. This is also the district's major Polio Plus fundraiser, so additional donations are more than welcome. Reservations are required by Friday, October 30th at noon, and will be provided in the meeting recap email as well. Finally, save the date for our next hybrid meeting at the Warwick Hotel and via Zoom, scheduled for November 19th. Reservations for this meeting will be required. Debbie, that's all for me. Back to you. Thank you very much, Roy. So we now have Carter Sales, who is going to give us a Woohoo Manatee final report. Carter is our Woohoo Manatee chair. He's also the Denver Rotary Club Foundation president. And he is in his, in his professional life, he's sales and broker principal for Carter Sales Commercial Real Estate Services. And Carter, there we are. I just got on, my goodness. <laughs> it was asking for a password and I didn't have a password. And I looked at another email. Anyway, hi everybody. Good morning. So Woo Humanity, we did finish our Woo Humanity Challenge. We did a total of 275 miles. Participants were Jim Goddard, Brian Sweet, Colleen and her husband, Brad. Uh, Colleen Cosette and her husband, Brad. and. Uh, Jim was the top rider at his 100 mile mark. And then Brian, Colleen and Brad did 50 and I, I finished out at 25. So we uh, actually raised uh, right around $4,500 depending on how they um, you know, calculate the fees for credit cards and take that out. So all totaled, we were just under $17 a mile in terms of statistics on the money that we raised. So one third of the $4,500 will go to Polio Plus, and that'll be just under $1,500. And two thirds will go to the DRCF uh, annual fund account. So uh, overall, there were 20 Rotary Clubs that participated in this district-wide event, and total raised was $82,000. So in spite of the setback with COVID, it was a very successful event. Uh, for the clubs that participated. And I could just add that Southeast Denver Rotary, out of the 82,000, they raised $68,000, so it was huge. Um, I guess they really looked at that as a, um, you know, their major fundraiser. So uh, we're looking at doing this again next June, right around the 21st. And uh, so what I, I have here is our set site on this this major fundraise for $68,000 that uh, Southeast Denver did. So I would definitely like to outdo that club uh, going forward. So I wanted to thank everybody for their support. Uh, we had club members, uh, club 31 members who did uh, donate generously. And then also all of us did fundraise on our own. So thanks to everybody and it was a great event and we'll look forward to doing it again next year. Back to you, Madam President. And what Carter didn't say is that in his 25 miles that he rode, 
he downplayed it. It was on a unicycle. <laughs> so um, I don't wow. know if you saw the celebrate our service that Todd Bacon helped put up, but it was uh, it was great to see Carter on his unicycle riding around. So wow. good job. And it is it is my unicycle. And in the unicycle community, we call it we lose our training wheel and just go with one. <laughs> <laughs> well, good job to everyone. It, and obviously we can keep building on that. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, next up is our good news buckets. We haven't had it for a couple of weeks um, with the programs and the time constraints that we had. So be thinking of your good news and our Denver Rotary Club Foundation trustee, Harriet Downer will be doing the red buckets for us. Harriet is president and owner of Logical Connections, LLC. So Harriet, do you have your red bucket ready to go? Absolutely, we are ready to go. And I am just typing in the link into the chat. And there we go. So the purpose of the Good News Red Bucket is for you to share your news, your updates, your announcements, to our fellow Rotarians and our guests today. We ask for a minimum contribution of $20 and you'll make that donation using the link that I posted into the chat or you can go to our website and go to give and it's there as well to give to DRCF. Uh, Lauren will include the same link in the after meeting announcement. If you've got good news to share, raise your hand either literally or go to the participants button down below. And um, Debbie, Lauren, and I will search for people with their hands up. Jean Herman, I already saw you. Um, just as a reminder for this first six months of the fiscal year through December, the donations go to Denver Rotary Club Foundation, TRF, the Rotary Foundation gets the second half of the year. And your donations to DRCF have done good works around the world through World Community Service, locally through Denver Kids, Community Resources, high school mentoring, on and on and on. So remember the, the our President Debbie's theme for the year, the power of one, you make a difference. So what is your good news? Who's got their hand up? Jean, I saw you, so I'll go to you first and Rob Clinton will come to you next. So on you, go for it, Jean. Um, I dropped off my six page ballot at the McNichols Center last night at 430 and I am proud I voted and I did all the research, including the judges. So, hey, it's I'm proud to be an American and able to vote. Thank you very much, Jean. Rob, we can go to you next. Great. Thanks, Harriet. Um, you can hear me. Uh, the, yes, uh, I, I, have a, I have a good news report from the program committee. And this is for everyone's calendar, a Rotary Extra event on Wednesday evening, November 11th at 7 p.m. Everyone will get a link. It will. It is a Eventbrite registration, no charge, uh, to join, uh, to hear a speaker that we would have had at Rotary had we had people be able to travel. And uh, it is joining the Denver Council on Foreign Relations to hear Constance Stelzenmuller, who is uh, the chair on foreign policy and international, well, excuse me, she's the, that was her prior position. She's currently the senior fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe in Brookings Institution. Uh, she'll be talking on the consequences of the US elections for the Transatlantic Alliance. Again, it'll be one hour from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Wednesday, November 11th. And you know, one of the value adds of Rotary is that we all get to have an opportunity to hear speakers we would not otherwise have a chance to hear uh, she is a German national, operates at the highest levels of advising governments, and is an expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign policy and security policy strategy. She speaks four languages. I've heard her speak. She'll be great. And it's just an extra opportunity for Rotary again on Wednesday, November 11th. And then the next day, on the 12th, we'll have Eric Sonderman, 
uh, a Colorado political consultant and now a writer uh, talking about the election results. That'll be Thursday, November 12th. So thanks very much. Perfect, thank you, Rob. And Mark, I see your hand up. Mark Whipper. Yep, thanks, Harriet. I just wanted to um, let everyone know that my daughter and her fiance took possession of their first house in Littleton yesterday, which is very exciting for them. They're getting married next summer um, in August and hopefully by then everything will be well under control so we can have a, a big celebration. So that's my good news for today. That's terrific news, thank you. And John Stewart, I see your hand. Uh, last week, the weekend before last, we traveled out to California to see our daughter Emily promoted to major in the Air Force. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely terrific. And I'm looking for other hands. Rich, is that a hand or an applause, Rich Harris? I, Steve, <laughs> I see Steve Mast waving his hand there. Okay, there he is, Steve Mast. Thanks, Harriet. Um, I'm anyway. Our, our son Brian and his now wife Stacy were supposed to get married in Italy. That, uh, needless to say, didn't work out so well. So instead, uh, a small group of us went down to <laughs> <laughs> went down to the Broadmoor, and uh, they got married down there. So um, we're excited for them, and they are anyway. They're now official, and we'll. We'll plan on trying to make the Italy trip next year in hopes that uh, we can. So anyway, congratulations to them. Oh, that's great news. Thank you. And do we have anyone else? I'm looking. I'm not seeing anybody. Oh. Mark Deneen, and we'll come to Bob Loudermilk next. Wonderful. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. So it seems that October may be the, the month of promotions. I'm very excited because I too also got promoted. So woohoo for that. I am uh, no longer a senior district executive with the Boy Scouts. I am now what they call a district director. So instead of serving uh, the northern part of Denver, I will be serving kind of the southeast part, which uh, is uh, Cherry Creek, Aurora, Centennial, and uh, all the way out to Briar. So it's uh, very exciting. I don't know anything about the area since I haven't been able to travel there, uh, but uh, slowly but surely, uh, I'll get to meet some kids, mm -hmm. see the area, meet some people. Uh, big step for me, very excited to help. Terrific, thank you, Mike. And Bob Loudermilk? I wanted to go ahead and brag about the fact that I have a 10 to 1 bet on the outcome of the presidential election and I expect to win. <laughs> well, we'll take any good news. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm not seeing anyone else with hand raised. I would like to take this moment to reiterate Peg Johnston's comment in the chat about please sign up for the November 1 President's Brunch, that there'll not only be an update from Holger Knack, the RI president, but also from the Gates Foundation. And you want to sign up not through the district, but through our club. So the RSVP has been in Lauren's um, email runs to us both the Tuesday and the Thursday. So thank you. Back to you, Debbie. All right. And on the heels of the RI president's dinner or lunch brunch, it was a board approved decision to support the uh, covering the $25, $28 that the, the brunch will cost. So it's free to all members. Troy mentioned that in his announcement. You'll see that following. We'd like to, it's a really a great opportunity. So I hope you can join us there. Well, Bob Loudermilk, we're coming back to you now for our program introduction. Bob is a past club president. 
He's a frequent supporter of the Red Bucket. I can vouch for that. And he is currently the president of Tectonic Construction Company. So, Bob? Your introduction is a little bit antiquated because uh, we, I'm now retired, <laughs> but that's all right. Now I, retired. I have known Dr. Root for decades. I uh, remember going out to, uh, to his lab and uh, him giving, giving us a lecture on uh, what he was doing with stem cell research and uh, uh, being absolutely so flabbergasted that when I looked into a, a electron microscope, to see what was inside there, my mouth dropped open because, uh, are you still there? Uh oh, there. And my mouth dropped open because uh, there was living stem cells in there uh, that had been converted into mouse heart stem cells, and and it just amazed me. And uh, he is now he has been involved in the Gates Biomedical Manufacturing Facility out there, and has been in the leading edge of research. In, uh, um, in the United States, truly. I'm just very happy to introduce Dr. Roop. No. There. Can I come over now? Yes. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Well, first I wanna thank Bob uh, for that nice introduction. Uh, Bob and uh, Ann Loudermilk have been uh, probably the longest supporters and visitors uh, to the Gates Center. I remember them first coming out in 2007 when I uh, came uh, here from Houston to uh, establish the Gates Center. So, um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, to give you an update. I, I didn't realize it's it's been since March of 16 since uh, I last spoke to the downtown Rotary. So uh, very happy to to give you uh, an update. So first, uh, just a little bit of background uh, for let's see if I can get the slide to change. Okay, Lauren, I may need some help here. This go to the bottom left and and hover over there for the arrows. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, so uh, quickly, just a little bit of background uh, uh, for those of you who may be new to the Rotary and and uh, to. Uh, uh, the Gates Center. Uh, the Gates Center was really made possible by uh, Charlie Gates and his family. Um, I think most of you know that Charlie Gates was the president and CEO of Gates Rubber. Uh, Charlie uh, was trained as an engineer. Uh, he made uh, major uh, advancements in bringing synthetics into rubber during World War II when there was a shortage of rubber. Um, uh, Charlie uh, was a, a patient at uh, University of Colorado Hospital, and shortly before his death, he had a conversation with his physician uh, about stem cells and the, um, the potential one day that stem cells may be able to re regenerate new tissues. Uh, Charlie uh, suffered from macular degeneration, so this was really um, something that he was very excited about, and he convinced his children, Diane Gates, Wallach and John Gates uh, to support stem cell research. And so that's how we uh, ended up being recruited uh, to Colorado. So just quickly, uh, I'll remind you that the Gates Center is actually a consortium center. We now have uh, over 120 members that are affiliated about half with the School of Medicine on the Anschutz Medical Campus. We have members at the downtown um, uh, Denver uh, campus, also the Boulder campus, uh, Colorado State University, probably at least 12 uh, members there that are doing stem cell research uh, using uh, animals. 
uh, members at uh, National Jewish Health and also the Colorado School of Mines. So I, I wanna give you an update on three different programs before I talk a little bit about future stem cell uh, therapies. Uh, the first is uh, the Gates Summer Internship Program, uh, which was uh, launched in the summer of uh, 2015, uh, uh, in part uh, due to a generous gift from Rhonda and Peter Grant. I think many of you know uh, the grants. Uh, the hope of the grants was that uh, the GSIP program would inspire outstanding young undergraduates to pursue careers in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. And uh, the first year in 2015, we started with 12 students. But as you can see, as you look down uh, the graph there, uh, the program has grown to a steady, uh, usually around 22, 23 summer interns. It's become very competitive. Uh, and uh, the 2020 class, there were 376 applications from all over the country for 22 positions. So in total, we've uh, accepted 117 interns during the last five years. And uh, four interns have actually com completed two years uh, of internship. I thought it be, might be nice to see, uh, recently we've started looking at outcomes where the career paths of these students have taken them. And these are, we've uh, completed that on about half of the students. And so these are just examples of the amazing institutions, uh, either graduate programs or medical schools that uh, these outstanding young uh, uh, scientists have um, been able to get accepted in. Uh, another group here, uh, you can see many of your uh, favorite institutions, including not only the University of Colorado, but um, many others. And then we've actually had four that have actually um, entered programs, um, international programs, one in Germany, uh, two at the University of Oxford, and then one at St. George's University School of Medicine in, in Granada. So uh, this program has really uh, turned out to be uh, an amazing success uh, and, and part of our major uh, educational uh, outreach. Uh, I, I just wanted to show you a few of the quotes uh, from some of the students. Let me see if I can move this. So uh, one of the quotes is while I expected the Gates Center's uh, summer internship program to change the way I looked at research. I did not anticipate how it would impact my self-perception. From the moment I started in the lab, I felt like a scientist. My ideas were valued. My contributions were validated. My presence, especially as a woman in science, was affirmed. The program helped me find the confidence I needed to continue pursuing a career in research. Another uh, summer intern, GSIP helped me realize my interest in stem cell biology applied to human disease. It helped me realize that I want to pursue a PhD in the field of biomedical sciences, and more specifically in research that incorporates stem cell biology in some way. So just a couple of the uh, quotes from uh, interns that have uh, participated uh, in our GSIP program. Of course, this year with COVID, um, we really had to pivot very quickly. So we had uh, uh, 22 uh, interns that were uh, planning to come to campus this summer. Uh, and suddenly uh, those plans were put on hawk. So I really want to acknowledge uh, the efforts of uh, the co-directors of the program, uh, Jill Cowperswaith, who's uh, on the top row uh, for our left and Joe Brzezinski, top row for our right, uh, as well as uh, Jessica Taylor Hurd, who's shown next to Jill and Jane Rep shown uh, on the bottom row on the left. Um, they really did an amazing job of making this a virtual program. Uh, the kids, uh, we have a video that we, we'll, we have posted on our website. Uh, they really appreciated, uh, even though they couldn't train on campus, the ability to uh, participate in the program. 
Next, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about the Gates Grubstake Fund. Uh, this fund was incorporated as a private 5013C foundation in August 2015. And it's a key component to the Gates Center's commercialization strategy for projects and teams affiliated with the Gates Center. Uh, the Gates Growth Sector Fund is overseen by the Gates Center with the support from CU Innovations. Uh, investment decisions are made on a competitive basis by a scientific investment advisory committee comprised of subject matter experts and institutional investors with a focus on biotechnology. Uh, the Grub Stake Fund with multiple awards of approximately $350,000 each is meant to bridge what we call the Valley of Death funding gap that often prevents promising medical concepts from being commercialized. So to date, this program has uh, funded 17 awardees. And this chart is just showing the progress of uh, the different uh, projects toward uh, uh, clinical application. And you can see that some are farther along than others, but there are um, at least uh, seven there that are in the process of following either pre-INDs or INDs. INDs are investigational new drug applications uh, with the FDA. Interestingly, um, we have five of those awardees have now uh, launched new startup companies uh, that are located uh, uh, just across the street in the biotechnology uh, park. Um, so to summarize, to date, uh, $5 million have been invested over the last six years. 17 projects have been awarded. There are five startups created. Seven are in preparation of filing pre-IND or IND applications with the FDA. And the follow-on funding that those programs have brought in is almost $30 million now. So, so almost a six-fold return on investment. So again, a real success story. So finally, uh, I know this is important to Bob and Ann because over the years when they would come out uh, for uh, tours and lectures, uh, we would talk about that we, uh, we had to open a good manufacturing practices facility if we ever wanted to get our uh, homegrown stem cell based therapies uh, into the clinic to treat patients locally. So I'm, I'm proud to say that finally in uh, April of 2015, we were able to open the Gates uh, Biomanufacturing Facility. Just quickly, uh, a GMP facility uh, complies with all FDA regulations. It's a very controlled environment. The materials used there have to be specified and qualified. The procedures have to be very robust so that they're very reproducible. Uh, they're tested uh, uh, to confirm that before they are released. Uh, so um, it, it really is very strict regulations to make sure anything we make in the, in the Gates Biomanufacturing Facility is safe and also will be effective. So we have the capacity to uh, manufacture uh, both cell-based therapies and pro protein-based therapies or biologics. And I, I just want to emphasize that um, the establishment of the Gates Biomanufacturing Facility is just a great example of how this community can come together. It was a partnership with not only uh, the University of Colorado School of Medicine and the Gates Center, but also University of Colorado Health and Children's Hospital Colorado, uh, along with the private sector. So in total, we raised about $11 million from the private sector and then the other institutions uh, contributed uh, another $6 million to uh, help subsidize operating funds during the first five years. So just to summarize and highlight some of the accomplishments now of the Gates Biomanufacturing Facility. Uh, the nice thing is with that facility, we can actually uh, have clients that are for-profit as well as nonprofit. And of course, the for-profit clients, we actually charge a margin. So those funds can actually offset and keep the cost of nonprofit uh, clients uh, low. So we've had 10 for-profit clients. We've had nine nonprofit clients. Uh, the Gates Biomanufacturing Facility has helped facilitate the filing 
of five INDs uh, with the FDA for cell-based therapies and one for a protein-based therapy. And, and one other highlight that I didn't indicate uh, on this slide is that uh, just a few weeks ago, um, the Gage Biomanufacturing uh, Facility um, manufactured the first cell-based therapy where the clinical trial was actually initiated on the Anschutz Medical Campus. The technology came from an invest investigator within the School of Medicine. It was manufactured in our facility and it was used to treat a patient over at University of Colorado Health. Uh, so that is a major milestone of being able to, this is what we dreamed of when we, we uh, built this facility is being able to do everything uh, right on campus and treat our own local patients. So uh, congratulations to the Gates Center uh, Biomanufacturing Facility for, for accomplishing that. Uh, and I'd also like to highlight how, how things really do link together. Um, seven of the uh, projects that were awarded through the Gates Grub Stake Fund are actually now clients of the Gates Biomanufacturing Facility. So the facility is helping these clients, again, progress their projects through FDA approval and into the clinic. And that's all done locally. Now, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about some of you have heard this lecture before. Um, my own research has been working for years on uh, a uh, inherited uh, group of inherited skin blistering diseases called epidermolysis bullosa. Uh, just briefly, there is no cure for, for these patients. Uh, and I think you can just see from the pictures, they, they live a, a life of, of severe pain, constant pain. Um, uh, depending on the type of EB, those patients can actually live to young adulthood. And if they do, most of them will then succumb to very aggressive skin cancers. So it's really a very brutal disease. And we've been working for years now uh, with our colleague over at Children's Hospital, Dr. Anna Bruckner, uh, to try to develop a cell-based therapy uh, for these patients. So just briefly, um, if you look at the slide on the left, uh, this was how we initially proposed to the FDA that we were going to treat these patients. Basically, you take a biopsy from the patient's skin, put the cells in culture, we go through a process to make what we call induced pluripotent stem cells from that patient. These are pluripotent stem cells, just like embryonic stem cells, but they come, come from the same patient. We then genetically correct the defect, differentiate the cells back into skin stem cells and return them to the patient as an autograph. So if you look at that uh, graph on the, the left, you'll see it's very complex and the FDA was concerned that, that there were too many manufacturing steps and it was too, uh, would take too long and was just too complex for manufacturing. So we made a breakthrough about three years ago in developing a much more efficient way where we can actually uh, combine gene editing and reprogramming in a single step. So we basically take a process that historically took months and reduced it down to two weeks. And so that now is the, uh, the approach that we're taking and currently trying to get FDA approval for. So traditionally, uh, the way that these genetically corrected cells have been delivered to patients is as epidermal sheets. So uh, on the, the far left, you'll see the cells are actually grown on a fibrin uh, matrices as a support structure they're then transplanted uh, to the patient in a quilt-like fashion to cover the areas that are prone to blistering. The problem with that approach is uh, it takes a long time uh, to generate these ep epidermal sheets uh, and get them uh, to the patient. It's very expensive because you spend months in a GMP facility uh, to, to manufacture the epidermal sheets. They have a short half-life and it's difficult to transport. So uh, we now have entered into a collaboration with an, a company called Avita Medical uh, to use a device that they now have FDA approval for, 
for delivering cells uh, to uh, patients with severe burns. It's really an amazing technology. Basically, it's approved as a device. If you look at the far uh, left-hand um, uh, corner on the bottom, you'll see um, the device. It's packaged sterile. It's battery operated. The first well uh, on the far left uh, is, batter is heated. Um, so you take a biopsy from a burn patient from an unburned area, uh, put it in that well for about 20 minutes. There's an enzymatic cocktail there that will dissociate the intact skin into single cells. After about 20 minutes, you remove the cells, you put them in the second well, which contains a proprietary buffer, you rinse them. The third well on the far right has a strainer. Uh, you uh, strain that cell suspension through. Uh, you then remove the stain, strainer, take a 10 mil syringe, pull up the cell suspension, and then you apply a nozzle on the end and then you spray this onto the patient. So you can take a one centimeter biopsy from unburned skin and cover 80 centimeters of burned area. And if you look on the bottom, you can see a child that has a scalded burn on the chest. And uh, 10 months later, you can see after spraying on cells, uh, there's uh, essentially no scarring, beautiful uh, re-epitheliation of the skin. And I'll show you one more example on the next slide. Uh, this is a young woman uh, who um, uh, suffered a burn on her face. Uh, she uh, was a person of color. Uh, Avita actually got uh, approval, uh, compassionate use approval. She was under the age of 18, which is the cutoff for the, for the FDA approval, but they uh, agreed to allow them to treat her. And you can see uh, one year later, again, beautiful uh, regeneration of the skin, but also regeneration of pigment. So she has the same pigmentation that she had before uh, the burn. So we think that this uh, approach um, will not only uh, allow us to get cells to patients much faster, but also um, we think that it's gonna be much less expensive. We don't have to manufacture the cells in the GMP facility for, for months and months. And also, ideally, we want to be able to make a frozen formulation of the corrected cells so we can freeze them. We could, we could have a biopsy shipped from any place literally in the world, come to our facility, we would do the genetic correction, reprogramming, differentiation, freeze the cells, ship them back, and their own family physician could then, in an outpatient setting, actually deliver the cells to the patient using the spray on scan device. So this is where we hope uh, this will go. And, and we're, we hope by this time next year, we will have uh, FDA approval, approval uh, to initiate treatment of the first patients. So, so that's how we're handling the skin problem. One other problem that these patients have, you can see that their, their, uh, their digits tend, tend to fuse into club hands and feet, but also, the epithelial that line uh, uh, internal structures like the esophagus are also very fragile. So just eating food can cause those cells to rupture and lice and, and, the, and the kids will develop strictures so they can no longer eat food. And many of them actually have to be uh, on feeding tubes. So, so how are we going to solve the problem of trying to correct these internal epithelia? So the way that we're going about that is um, several years ago, I gave this talk at Harvard and I basically got to the same point and I said, we think we can solve the skin problem. How are we going to solve the problem with internal epithelia? And Robert Sextine, uh, a scientist there came up to me after my talk and said, I think I can solve your problem. He was trained as a bone marrow transplant physician and one of his first patients, uh, 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 died because of failure of engraftment. So he came, became intrigued with how do he, hemopoietic stem cells or blood stem cells, when you do a bone marrow transplant, how do they know to go into the bone marrow? And I won't go into detail, but basically it took him about 20 years. He figured out that there's a modification on the cell surface, which we call a ligand, that actually binds to a receptor 
that is expressed in uh, the blood vessels within the bone marrow. So the cells can go through the circulation, they see the receptor, they bind, and then they will uh, translocate out of the blood vessel into the, to the bone marrow. So uh, it occurred to us that we might be able to use this now to redirect corrected stem cells into internal epithelia. And, and so to test that, we did the following experiment. We took um, what we call mesenchymal stem cells that uh, express a green fluorescent protein and we injected them into the tail vein of a mouse that expresses red fluorescent protein. And then we induced injury uh, to the ear. And then since the ear is thin, we can actually see in real time, the cells move into the, the injured tissue. So that was the hope. And so assuming the movie plays, if you look on the far left, this is a, a, a uh, low magnification of the ear. And if you look on the far right, you can actually see the red is the blood vessel, the green are the cells that we modified on the surface to, to create the ligand that binds to a receptor that's up, upregulated in sites of injury. And so you can see the cells come through, they stop, and then they, they migrate through the vessel wall and into the tissue. And so it's, it's really amazing. Uh, at the first time we saw this, I, I really ran out of the lab looking for Jill or anyone else that I could find. So you've got to come and see this. This is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. So uh, the great thing was the mouse was still alive. We, we, we put it back in, the, in, in the, the mouse house and we waited five weeks and we imaged again just to see, are the cells still there? Not only were the cells still there, they had actually multiplied. So if you look over on the far uh, top left, you can see a cluster of green dots those are cells that have actually replicated and, 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 and divided and increased in number. So if we think now about how we're going to treat patients, we know we'll have to give multiple doses. So to simulate that, we decided to inject these cells that are modified to express the ligand on the surface once a week for four weeks to see if we could see if the cells accumulate. And in fact, they do. There you can see uh, a, a site of injury where we induced injury to mimic uh, the fragile uh, epithelium that you would find in one of these EV patients. Now you can see multiple green dots uh, that now have accumulated. So we think that, that this will not only be a way to actually treat uh, these EV patients who have very fragile internal epithelia, we think that this can actually now be applied to many other diseases. Just think, is this a better way to deliver stem cells to, to arthritic joints, uh, to patients who have uh, inflammatory bowel disease or lung inflammation? So this just may be a much better way to deliver these cells, which we know can alter um, uh, inflammation uh, through the circulation rather than try to inject them into the site uh, of, of inflammation. So with that, I'd like to just close and uh, acknowledge uh, we've been very fortunate to um, uh, form a, a consortium with investigators at uh, Stanford, Tony Orwell and his group, and at Columbia, uh, Angela Cristiano. We've been supported by three foundations that were all started by parents who have kids with EB, the EB Research Partnership, the Sohana Research Fund, and the EB Medical Research Foundation. Uh, we formed the consortium in 2016, and as a result of uh, agreeing to work together and uh, developing this new way of combining gene editing and reprogramming into a single step, uh, we were able to get additional funding, um, most importantly from the National Institutes of Health, from the National Institute of Arthritis, Muscular Skeletal Skin Diseases, from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, and from the Department of Defense. Um, and finally, I would like to give special thanks uh, for uh, assistance with making some of those uh, wonderful graphic slides uh, that I showed you from Jessica Taylor Hurd, Jill Cowperswaite, and Jane Reck. So um, with that, uh, hopefully there's time for a few questions. Uh, I'll be glad to try to, to answer them. This is Debbie Beasley. Thank you so much, Doctor. I have asked folks to send questions to me 
you can do it either via private chat or to everyone. Um, I am not seeing any questions at right now, but let me go back. And Bob has one. All right, Bob. Bob, you're muted. There we are. Um, I, I, I made an assumption years ago that the Gate Biomedical Manufacturing Facility was going to be making hearts and lungs and actually making the, 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 the organs themselves. But I, I'm looking at this, I'm wondering if, if the long-term goal is not to report, repair the organs that people have. Is, is that one of the trends that is, is coming or, or what? Oh, I, I think it will. Uh, obviously, the, the, you know, the first, uh, that first cell-based therapy uh, where I told you everything was initiated on campus, um, that was actually for a cell-based immune therapy for pa patients with cancer. So in that case, you actually take out lymphocytes, T cells, from the patient with cancer. Uh, in the, the Gates Biomanufacturing Facility, we modify those cells with a virus so they can now uh, recognize the cancer cells. We, um, we um, uh, increase the number of those cells, we expand them, and then we infuse them back into the same patient. So that's been, um, some of you may have heard about this therapy, it's called CAR T cell, uh, uh, chimeric antigen uh, T cells that can now recognize the cancer cells and destroy them. So um, that's one of the first, uh, that's actually been approved by the FDA. Uh, so, um, um, you know, we, we kind of take baby steps and start with that, but certainly there are many other projects underway. Uh, we have um, uh, one investigator that's, that's now uh, going through a similar approach and making these induced prepotent stem cells and differentiate, differentiating those into retinal pigment epithelial cells as a cure for macular degeneration. And so they currently actually are um, implanting those cells into um, many pigs, small pigs, where you can actually induce macular degeneration. And we should know uh, soon if, if those are successful. And if so, those uh, will be moving into patients. So that's, that, that's just an example of a few things that uh, are, are currently uh, underway on campus. Boy, that's wonderful. Amazing, there is a, several comments about the amazing work and just the incredible breakthroughs. Here is a question for you. How long do you expect it to take before the spray on stem cells are available and the injected stem cells delivery? Well, we hope that uh, we're in the process of submitting the pre-IND application with the FDA now. And our hope is that by uh, next fall, uh, we will be approved to, uh, to treat the first patients with the spray on skin device. The systemic deliver delivery of these cells, uh, modified cells into the bloodstream, you know, that's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, um, the FDA, of course, the advantage of the skin is, is when we deliver cells, it's very easy to monitor the site of delivery. So if there was an adverse event, uh, for example, the FDA is concerned that maybe these modified cells may cause a cancer. The good thing with the skin is we can actually see it. We could excise it before it, uh, uh, spreads. Um, with internal uh, delivering cells to internal organs, we'll have to, to um, repeat safety studies many times to make sure that those cells are safe because there it would be much more difficult to monitor for an adverse event. So it'll take uh, several more years before the, the uh, systemic delivery uh, is approved. Uh, two more quick questions I think we can get in. Um, are you working with the Department of Defense on wound healing? The, 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 the interest of the Department of Defense is um, the exposure of troops to vesicants like mustard gas introduces blisters that are very similar to the blisters that our patients with EB uh, develop. 
and those wounds uh, and, and the, uh, the troops that get exposed to mustard gas, they don't uh, heal as fast uh, as, a, as a regular blister. So the FDA, I mean, the DOD is, is very interested. Could this technology be used to treat uh, patients who, who, who or troops that, that might be exposed to mustard gas? And that you know, affects not only the skin, but in some cases, they actually inhale and so it can affect the airways as well. So again, the systemic delivery could be beneficial there uh, for, for uh, breathing in uh, a vesicate like mustard gas. And the last question, I'm not sure if we touched on this. On the macular degeneration research, do you know how long it may be before it will be available to administer and where? Well, as I said, that's being developed on campus. The, uh, the preclinical safety studies uh, and efficacy studies are, are currently being done on campus. Uh, they use a miniature pig model. Um, and uh, I think as soon as, as those studies look promising, they will be submitting uh, a pre-IND application to the FDA. So again, cautiously optimistic, maybe a year and a half, two years. Well, thank you so much. What an amazing and informational speech today. That was so uh, interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but in within Rotary, our goal is to eradicate polio throughout the world. In your honor for speaking with us today, we have made a donation to Polio Plus to inoculate 33 children. And with the Bill and Melinda Gates two to one match, that means 100 children around the world will be inoculated. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for making that donation. All right, next week's program, Jim Johnston's gonna take a couple minutes to talk about that before we, do, we end with our four-way test. So Jim, are you out there? I am. Yes. Uh, thank you, Debbie. And I'll keep it. I'll keep it real quick. But next week's program on Thursday, uh, President Debbie is going to be off gallivanting in Utah having fun. So I've agreed to run the meeting. And it's also the program that happens to be about uh, Quest 31, the strategic planning project that we've been working on for many months now. Uh, so it works well for me to step in as the chair of Quest 31 and, and update folks and engage you all with content that we've been talking about and working about. There's been a lot of people doing fits of work here and there on our mission and our vision on the club structure, uh, service, membership, and we'd love to have an interactive think polls and breakout rooms uh, discussion with you next week to uh, share what's what's going on with that and uh, put it in front of you and start getting some feedback. It is also uh, two days before World Polio Day. And so we will have a tribute and recognition of that given how it's uh, near and dear to Rotary. So uh, that's next week on Thursday. I hope that you will come join us. Thank you, Jim. And it is on Zoom. So join us next week say, and join us at 11.45 for the um, in front of the meeting kind of breakout networking opportunity. So we will conclude with the four-way test. Please join me. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.